Hey guys, it is Rick and I'm here with the last review video for the month of June. We have 11 movies to talk about, uh, some first time watches, a few rewatches, and we're going to dive right in. Uh, when we watched this movie, it was the last movie left in the hat before we replenished the hat. Also, when we sat to watch this, there was a lot of controversy surrounding this movie that was not initially uh, there or present as much as it was when we watched it, when it was put in the hat. But it was a first time watch for me. Uh, it is my girlfriend's favorite movie of all time. And that is Gone with the Wind. I found out this is part of a big box set, but this is the version of Gone with the Wind that I have. Um, so we watched Gone with the Wind. It was my first time watching it. Uh, the four hour runtime of this film was always an intimidating uh, step for me. I did not want to dive into a four hour movie. I kept putting it off. So we dove into it and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, I thought the story is very well done. Uh, the Blu-ray looks fantastic, especially for a movie that is 81 years old. The movie looks great. The costuming is fantastic in the film. Um, I'm going to go on record, uh, by saying Scarlett O'Hara here, this lady right here, uh, he's a very unlikable character. As a matter of fact, I really despised her character. I did not care for her. But I also get it. I mean, Rhett Butler is not a very likable character as well to an extent. Um, but the movie is still very enjoyable. And uh, Scarlett basically does what they what she needs to do to... To make things work. So, um, you know, the runtime didn't really, it, it drug in parts, but not much. Uh, you know, me personally, when I sat and watched The Irishman, which was three hours and 40 minutes, I think, I had a very hard time getting through that. I had to keep pausing it. I was, you know, took breaks to do other stuff. It was a very hard, like, to sit through. I think we paused this maybe once to, to go to a bathroom or I went to a bathroom or like got something to eat and it was a very brief pause and it was right back into the movie. There is an intermission, um, that we just fast forwarded through, but, um, I really, really enjoyed the film. I, I really am glad I finally watched it and, uh, you know, I was highly invested in the story. I was intrigued to see what would happen next throughout. So I give the movie a five out of five. Gone with the Wind is it's absolutely fantastic. And I get all the hubbub. Um, I know some people don't like it. I, I, I personally can't agree with that. I mean, I really enjoyed the film. Uh, Clark Gable and Vivian Lee were both fantastic in the leads. And uh, yeah, Gone with the Wind, five out of five for me. Uh, next up, we watched a newer film. It was the first movie out of the Fresh Hat. And it is The Way Back, starring Ben Affleck. <clears throat> so I wanted to check this out in theaters before everything kind of uh, got shut down. So I wanted to check it out when it came to, to home video. And I actually paid, I, I think I bought it at Walmart for 20 bucks. I really wanted to see it. Uh, I don't know why I bought it right away, knowing I wasn't going to watch it right away. But um, Blind bought it and sat down. We checked it out. And I... I really enjoyed the film. Uh, it definitely did not disappoint me. A lot of people were disappointed in this movie. I, I think that the movie has its issues. Like, don't get me wrong. I'll talk about some of that stuff. But I will say Ben Affleck, who plays Jack Cunningham, uh, who is basically a former high school basketball legend, turned really, really bad alcoholic, um, did a great job in the role. <clears throat> there were issues I had with the movie, like his... His character is drinking all day. He's drinking at work. He's drinking in the morning in the shower. He's drinking at a bar as soon as he gets done from work, passes out, wakes up and does it again. And there's part of the movie where he's he stops drinking or is made to believe he stops drinking. And he doesn't go through any withdrawal symptoms. Um, he's just like lives his normal life. If somebody drank to the extent that Ben Affleck's character drinks in this movie and stop drinking, he would be violently ill. Uh, he would be getting sick. He would be going through horrible withdrawals and they did not show that. So in a movie that primarily focuses on Ben Affleck's character, not as much basketball. I mean, 
The basketball team in this movie is a secondary part of the story. It focuses on his addiction. I have issues with them not showing how badly um, his addiction would have affected him. But that's a nitpick, I guess. Um, the movie is a redemption story. It, it does a good job. Uh, I enjoyed the film. It's a sports drama, but like I said, it focuses more on Affleck's character. Um, and he was great in the film. And you were rooting for his character, even though he kept kind of screwing up. And you were hoping he would get the help he needed. And I'm not going to spoil the movie, but I recommend checking this out. Is it the best movie ever? No. Is it the greatest sports movie ever? Not even close. The best movie of 2020? No. But is it good? Yes, I give it a three and a half out of five. Would definitely recommend it. It is making my shelf, so I enjoyed it. Uh, next up, we watched a movie on HBO Max. I don't seem to have issues watching stuff on HBO Max like other people on YouTube do. Crazy Joe, Jacob. Um, but that's because I have a smart TV and I have HBO Max right on it. I don't use a Roku or a Fire Stick. So we watched Mr. Holland's Opus, uh, which I had never seen, Bridget had seen. It was a movie that had been on my watch list for many years. And uh, finally sat down to watch it, and I loved it. Uh, Richard Dreyfuss was absolutely outstanding as the lead, uh, Mr. Glenn Holland. And it's basically his career as a teacher um, for 30 years, starting with him first getting the job to the, the day he retires. And there's, you know, he's a music teacher, so there's a lot of music in the film. There's lots of relationships in the film. There's, it's a very heartwarming story. It also shows personal stuff that was going on in his life. Um, stuff with his son was very, very heartbreaking in parts. Uh, I'm not going to spoil anything, although the movie is like 30 years old now. But um, the importance of this movie is how important it is for arts in the schools and uh, how important teachers are to people, especially good teachers, and how they can have a lifelong impact on you. And I really enjoyed the movie. I wish it got a Blu-ray release. I know it is on DVD, so maybe if I find it out and about, I will add it to the shelf. But I hope for a Blu-ray release one day. Come on, Disney. You're not putting anything else out right now. Put it out. Disney Movie Club exclusive. That's fine. So I give it a four out of five. Uh, I really enjoyed Mr. Holland's Opus. Next up, we checked out. No, we didn't. I checked out. Uh, this was my dude flick one day. And it is American Assassin. Uh, so this movie starts off firing on all cylinders. Uh, there is an opening scene in this film that's absolutely, it was shot awesome. Uh, it was like you were right in the middle of action, kind of just thrown right into um, the scene. Dylan O'Brien's character, Mitch, is at the beach um, about to propose to his girlfriend, I believe. He's about to propose, or he just proposed, and they're celebrating on the beach, and uh, terrorists basically invade the beach and kill his girlfriend and leave him wounded. Um, and he basically seeks revenge after that. Um, the, the opening scene though comes off as so realistic and scary. It really sets the standard of the film and the rest of the film doesn't live up to that standard in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> the second and third act dramatically slow down the film. Uh, Taylor Kitsch is in the movie and in my opinion his character comes off as pretty annoying more than anything else which seems to be par for the course with Taylor Kitsch. Uh, I don't think I've seen much of him in anything where I've been like, wow, that was really great, or wow, he really shined. Doesn't happen much, in my opinion, with Taylor Kitsch. Um, Michael Keaton and Dylan O'Brien are both great in the film, but this isn't anything that I thought was amazing or rewatchable, so this will not be making the shelf. Uh, this will either go up on eBay or get traded into PAMS. I, I don't think this has much value, so it'll probably get traded into PAMS. But American Assassin, watchable, but not rewatchable. I give it a three out of five. Next up was a movie, um, Bridget Owns, that I had never seen. And she said we should check out, knowing that I love Stripes. She recommended we watch Private Benjamin, starring Goldie Hawn. And uh, this movie was okay for me. Um, not really more or less than that. It was just all right. Uh, it's advertised as a comedy. Um, 
I asked Bridget, I said, is this a comedy? And she goes, yeah, it's a comedy. And then she kind of revisited that at the end. She goes, well, it's not as much of a comedy as I remember, but um, there was a lot of, there was a big lack of humor in my opinion, at least now. I mean, this movie is from 1980, so it's 40 years old. Um, I also enjoyed the movie quite a bit while she's um, in basic training and whatnot. And then when she goes to Paris, the movie just really meandered for me and I was like losing interest very fast. Um, but I just don't have much to say in regards to the movie. It just not, it wasn't my cup of tea. I mean, I was glad I watched it. I gave it a two and a half out of five, but just not something I would, I would want to revisit personally. But Private Benjamin was the next thing we checked out. And then we watched a movie on Vudu. We did another rental. We've, we've been doing a little more on Vudu with the newer stuff that's been available. We checked out You Should Have Left, which is from Blumhouse and stars Kevin Bacon and Amanda Seyfried. Seyf <clears throat> uh, the movie wasn't really on my radar at all. And then a trailer dropped and it looked like it would be creepy. Um, I, unlike Crazy Joe, Crazy Joe seems to think that Blumhouse is pretty consistent and reliable when their name is stamped on stuff. I think they have a 50-50 record uh, for me personally. A lot of what they put out is mediocre in my opinion um not fantastic films but not awful just just in the middle but there's also for every get out there's a truth or dare but then there's a lot of ma and happy death day 2 and fantasy island like all middle of the road two to three star movies not a lot of three and a half or four star movies there are there are some i'm not saying there aren't any there's also half star movies to counterbalance. So Blumhouse doesn't do it for me. When I see Blumhouse, I'm not like, this is gonna be gold. Like some people are with Blumhouse, some people are with A24. I don't think the studio or the production company necessarily guarantees one way or the other. So went into the movie and uh, right away, the opening scene was a bit eye rolling for me. So I kind of got taken out of it very early because what happens it's a very very stereotypical horror cliche and then they double they double that cliche so it was already on my nerves um and the problem is that the, i put right in my review the problem is the cheapness of the opening scene is used for multiple scares in this film and to be honest the movie's not scary at all i hate the idea of a dream leading to a scare and then the person waking up. I hate that trope. Uh, and this movie uses that trope a lot, not just once or twice, multiple times. That could be a bit spoil spoilery, but it isn't really. Um, the movie's very predictable for sure. And uh, it's just not very good or special. Uh, the ending happens and it felt like a cop-out to me. I, I gave the movie a two out of five. I, I'm bummed I spent the money to rent it. Um, definitely was a letdown. Definitely will not watch it again. Not going to buy it on physical. Can't really recommend it. Like I said, two out of five, you should have left. Um, yeah. But if you guys want to watch a good scary movie, the next thing that we checked out was... The Babadook, and this was fantastic. Uh, the movie is incredibly well written. It is shot well. It's very creepy, in my opinion, especially having a child. Uh, I think this movie is a little extra creepy. The last 20 minutes of this film had me like looking out of the side of my eye, doing one of the, like one of these things for the last 20 minutes. Um, I just found the movie to be very creepy. It did a great job of being unsettling without gore or cheap jump scares. This movie is just scary, in my opinion. It was well done. <clears throat> um, the first 45 minutes of this movie, the sun in the film, I don't... Uh, I don't know his name. Noah Wiseman might be the sun. 
The kid is so annoying. Uh, he drives you insane, but I think that's part of what it's supposed to do. But his character is so annoying. Um, yeah. And, um, but the second half of the movie kind of flipped it and had me like pulling for the sun and, and, and feeling for his character, which is great for a film to do. It, the film gets you to hate the character and then it gets you to feel for that character and like him. Uh, not in the first half. I don't like his character in the first half, but it's one I'd recommend for sure. Creepy, uneasy. Fun fact, this is the first Blu-ray ever sent to me by Mr. Joe Martinez. And it's staying on the shelf because this was absolutely fantastic. Four out of five. The Babadook. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and next up was another first time watch for both of us, Bridget and myself. And it is The Commitments, the, this being the 25th anniversary edition. Uh, this is about Jimmy Rabbit, who is um, the world's greatest band manager in his head because he doesn't manage a band. Um, so he basically puts out newspaper articles uh, not, not articles, newspaper advertisements to form an Irish rock band and uh, basically forms a, a rock and roll soul band. The music in this movie is outstanding. Uh, I really enjoyed the film. Bridget didn't like it as much as I did, but I actually have gotten the soundtrack from a Goodwill since because I enjoyed it so much. And um, the first 30 minutes is a bit slow in the film, but after that, when the band forms and there's lots of musical performances and, and just music in the movie, I really, really enjoyed it. And the movie really shined. Uh, I thought the drama and the chemistry of the band really meshed well. And uh, there are some predictable beats in the movie, which hurt it a bit, but I enjoyed it. It's making the shelf three and a half out of five for me. Uh, next up, we watched a movie on Hulu called The Host, which is directed by Bong, not the <clears throat> Stephanie Meyer host, The Host directed by Bong Joon-ho, who also directed um, Snowpiercer, Parasite, um, I'm blanking on the other movie right now. Why am I blanking? Snowpiercer, Parasite, Okja. Uh, yeah, so going into this movie, we had loved all three of those movies, Snowpiercer, Ocha, and Parasite, they were all like three and a half or four stars for me. Um, and this movie starts off, it's a good mix of humor and monster movie action. So once again, uh, the humor aspect that Bong Joon-ho nails in his films, even if there's drama or horror, there's still this humor in the movie, whether it be dark humor or just, you know, self-deprecating humor. And the first 30 minutes is really good, but then the problem is that the movie meanders for about an hour. The middle hour of the host is pretty just, nothing, nothing is really going on. There's not enough to keep you interested in what's happening to characters. Um, the, the last 20, 20 minutes, 25 minutes is really good, but half of the movie's good and half of it is kind of boring. So that really affects it. And, um, I just don't think this is something I would watch again. I'm not really like set out to find it on physical to rewatch it. I give it a two and a half out of five. It just wasn't on the same level as those other movies for me. Would much rather revisit Ocha, Snowpiercer, Parasite. I still want to watch Mother, which is his first movie, I believe. So we'll have to check that out at some point. But um, The Host, two and a half out of five. Next up was a rewatch um, for us. We'd been wanting to revisit this. <clears throat> and it is um, probably my favorite Kevin Smith movie of all time. And uh, it is Chasing Amy. As you can see, this is a triple feature with Jan Silent Bob, Strike Back, and Clerks. But we watched Chasing Amy starring Crazy Joe of Megapodtastic. And um, the acting in this film I thought was really good for a Kevin Smith film. Um, you know, it's probably the most mature of Kevin Smith's work. There's some stuff in the reboot that is on the same level of maturity, but as a whole film, I think that Chasing Amy is his most mature film um, to date. 
<clears throat> the there's also uh, part of reboot that rewatching this makes me appreciate that part of the film much more. Um, it's funny how rewatching this, you realize how much of a jerk Holden McNeil is. That's Ben Affleck's character. He's really just a jerk of a guy. He's not a good dude. Um, he has insecurities that are pushed onto his best friend and his girlfriend of his own. And he takes everything out and thinks that everybody's problems are his problems. And it's, it's, <sighs> and it, Kevin Smith probably gives one of his best silent Bob, uh, portrayals in this film as well. Um, the chasing Amy speech in this movie is awesome. And Kevin Smith is so good in it. Uh, it's funny while that scene is happening, I was paying more attention to Jason Mew's character while he was um, giving the Chase Amy speech. And the whole time Jason Mew's is eating spoonfuls of sugar. Uh, I know while they were filming it, he was really bad into heroin. He was falling asleep while filming that scene. And so the scene in the film, he's literally just eating spoonfuls of sugar, which is funny because his character gets brought, I think, like an iced tea and he has a bagel. Uh, and nope, no interest in those. He's just straight up just eating sp spoonfuls of sugar the whole time. So um, the movie's very quotable. Uh, it's not the greatest looking film. Uh, you can tell it's one of Kevin Smith's early films. It was shot okay, but there's some issues. There's a shot in the rain when they're panning across a building and you can see Kevin Smith and crew walk by while they're filming the scene. Uh, but the story absolutely crushes it for me and I give it a four out of five. Chasing Amy, highly recommend, along with all the other Kevin Smith uh, Jersey trilogy films. And uh, then we got one more movie to talk about and we're done with June. And this movie here, uh, I'll jump ahead and also tell you guys it is the surprise of the month. So the last movie we watched in June was the surprise of the month for me. Uh, it was a first time watch. It was something I blind bought off of Amazon on 4K. Spoiler alert for a future video where I'll pretend like I'm opening this for the first time. Uh, and that is Pan's Labyrinth on 4K. And uh, Bridget was very worried I was not going to like this. Martinez Joe reached out to me. He goes, it's a great movie, but I don't think you're going to like it. And uh, to my surprise and to their surprise, they were both wrong. I really, really enjoyed Pan's Labyrinth. Uh, the movie was very, very enjoyable for me. I really enjoyed watching it. Um, I love the storyline with the captain. That character very much reminded me of Inglorious Bastards and Christoph Waltz's character. That, that's just where I correlated in my head. Um, because he was just a terrible person and very similar to Christoph Waltz's character. And uh, the visuals in the film were fantastic. Uh, it was incredibly well done. The movie is not a light watch. It is a very heavy watch. Um, but it doesn't matter because the movie was absolutely excellent. I loved Pan's Labyrinth. So glad I bought it. Definitely staying on the shelf. Definitely will rewatch it. Um, so very good. I enjoyed it. I give it a four out of five. And like I said, that was the surprise of the month. Uh, 32 movies watched in June. Obviously, compared to, you know, April and May and March, the movie count has dropped. It's going to keep happening as, as life kind of goes back to, to more normal. Hopefully, we'll see. Um, so, surprise of the month we talked about. And Hot Trash of the Month is a tie uh, the big no-brainer we talked about in the last video was Rub and Tug. Uh, this movie is horrible, but we all knew it was going to be horrible going in. We weren't expecting it to be good. So outside of that, Hot Trash of the Month goes to Disney Plus's Artemis Fowl, uh, a movie that was 90 minutes and felt like a gigantic mess. Uh, it was unfunny. It was messy. And it was just uh, it was sad that... Um, Disney really dropped the ball with it, I think. So, Artemis Fowl, Rub and Tug, Hot Trash of the Month, and Pen's Labyrinth, Surprise of the Month. So, thank you guys for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. 
Also subscribe to the channel if you do not do so already. It is much appreciated. Leave comments down below. Let me know what you guys think of what I watched. Are you fans of it? Are you not fans? Let me know your thoughts. So also check out the description box down below where you can find links to my uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, eBay page, uh, Letterboxd where I rate and review all the movies I watch, Amazon wishlist, Blu-ray.com profile, Letterbox, where I rate and review all the movies I watched. I feel like I just said that, so I probably said it twice. Email address and P.O. Box can all be found down below. So, as always, guys, thank you for watching. Until next time, who's down to movie?